here, sent me an email about 10 minutes ago. He just wanted to let me know how his earning straddles went. Um, straddle, of course, is buying a call and buying a put at the same strike price. If they're different strike prices, that would be a long strangle. Uh, but a straddle or strangle is a popular technique used around earnings, even though there is a volatility crush. Macy's had a good move. Walmart about 11% yesterday. Uh, he had calls and apples. Cisco was a good movement. Um, it says Canopy. Uh, this one was a big move. 22 straddle got out today at 33, so almost an 11-point move. And all straddles were two weeks to expiration uh, and selling against the losses to get some premium back. What he means by that is he opens a straddle with two weeks to expiration and earnings coming up in one or two days. And if the earnings doesn't give him a good enough move for profit on the position, since he still has two weeks to go, he'll start selling near-term calls and puts, sort of creating little spreads, or you might even call them uh, weekly diagonal spreads, to hedge the price cost and the volatility crush that experienced if the stock didn't move more than 3 or 4% as well. Okay, all right, but we did have a question, a straight question come in from Kokan that we're going to look at first. And Kokan says that he entered a position on August 9th for Yelp when it was at 49.36. Did a September 21st bull put spread. And bull put credit spread, of course, is we're going to sell an out of the money put and then buy a further or lower out of the money put option for a net credit. Wukong got about a 12 cent net credit opening this position. Now it's 30 cents to close. Would like some options to manage. Uh, we'll still close to stop my loss. Okay, well, let's take a look at that. We're going to navigate over to Power Options now. And we're going to take a look at the custom spread tool and the Yelp position um, there as well. So first things first, let's go ahead and change our screen over. There we go. And what you're looking at here, of course, is just the 14-day trial, the initial trial uh, to power options. Those of you who are currently on a trial, I encourage you to take advantage of the four steps here to get more familiar with the tools. The quick start guide, free flash tutorials, uh, free webinars that are available, and, of course, free coaching sessions. The free webinars, the live webinars, of course, and the um, archived ones. All right. Now, we're going to analyze a position on Yelp using the custom spread tool. I'm also going to take a look at the chart. So I'm going to go to custom spreads. Now, if you don't know the symbol, you probably would know the symbol. Uh, I actually had to look it up. I forgot that Yelp is just Yelp. But you can always use the lookup feature here. And click look up there to just type in the symbol. Submit. And so we just have Yelp. I thought it was YY at first, then I realized that was YY Inc. But in any case, let's take a look at Cocon's position. I'm going to click on Yelp here and let's click on View Options. We have a September 21st. Sold the 44 put, bought the 43, a one strike difference. And he said he received 12 cents on the position. Okay, well, I don't know the exact prices, so we're just going to say we sold one contract at 24 cents and bought one contract of the lower strike 43 for 12. Let's take a look at our bull put credit spread. Now, we have a 12 cent net credit, but as Kokan mentioned, it's going to be roughly 30 cents to close. At midpoint, when I looked at it five minutes ago, I noticed that it was uh, 27 cents. So it is more than double the initial net credit. That's a trigger an investor might use as a management point. Now, the stock's at 45.36. It's still a dollar. 36 above the short put strike price. This is the pivot. When I'm in a bull put spread or the reverse, a bear call credit spread, the short strike is usually my pivot. The stock reaches maybe within one or maybe 0.5% of that short option strike price. I may look to roll or manage the position. Uh, Sam uh, comments he did not buy the stock. No, I don't think he bought Yelp. Uh, I don't think Ocon has Yelp. We're just in a standard bull put credit spread. Okay, all right, now let's take a look. Let's, let's just erase the drawings real quick here. And I want to take a look at just the chart. Where were we between August 9th? Okay, let me change this. Whoops, sorry about that, folks. Let me get rid of this. 
Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to just change this to a one month chart. And I'm going to use my indicators. I like to use the simple moving average of the 20 day. And the reason why is I like to look at the Bollinger Bands, which is based on that 20 day average. Um, I would like to look at MACD, maybe RSI. You can customize this any way you want to, and I'll keep volume there as well. So let's take a look at just the one month chart. All right, good. So on or around August 9th, right after the big move, and this is likely related to earnings, we were up at 48, almost went to 50. We did go above 50, but it never closed above 50. And right about this point is where we did the 44-43 bull put spread. This looks like a Bollinger Band breakout where it broke above the upper band, closed above it, and then there's usually a little pullback before it settles and it moves back up. However, you can see the RSI is declining and the MACD is getting closer, though it is still rather bullish. Okay, so that's where we stand right now. Wukong likely jumped into this position after earnings, thinking the stock would continue to move up, and it may, or it may come back down and test the 20-day moving average around the 41.50, 41.85 mark. All right, so what can we do? All right, now, in general, we tend to look at seven ways to manage a bull put spread. Why so many? Well, because each situation is a little bit different, and it'll depend on what's available. And one of the seven techniques I usually like to do cannot be done in this scenario. All right, so what are scenarios? As Kokan mentioned, number one, we can close the position now, take the loss. We didn't see the gain that he continued to want after the earnings where it would continue to move up. So we could close now, take the loss, and rather than try to make it back in Yelp, because we're not sure what direction it's going, try to make it back with other bullish stocks doing bull put spreads or other strategies. So close and take the loss. No one really wants to do that, but sometimes it's better than option number two. And option number two, in this case, you may consider closing the spread so we'll close the spread for the loss. It's still September 21st. And we set about 27 cents. So we'd have a 15 cent loss. We may try to roll down. So you're going to roll down the spread, buy back the 44, sell to close the 43. Again, costs you about 27 cents at midpoint. So you have a 15 cent loss because you still keep the 12 cents. And then if you can get September 21st, 12, 15, or 20 cents for the 42.41, we'll try to make it back that way. I'm not a fan of just rolling down the spread. And the reason why is because we were wrong on what we thought was going to happen in the first place. And if it continues down, we can take a bigger loss on the next one. So you have to make sure that you're still bullish. You have to make sure that you think that even though it's threatening the 44 strike, but not there yet in this case, do you think it's going to recover and move back up? Because if you try to catch the falling knife and just keep rolling down, rolling down, and rolling down, then eventually you might take larger losses than you were planning on the first place. It's only a dollar spread. I'm sure Kokan has more contracts, but that's option number two. Option number three that I normally use is not available at this time. And what I typically like to do is buy to close the short my 44 and roll down one strike. In general, when I open a spread, I leave two strikes apart. I might have opened the, sold the 44, excuse me, and bought the 42. So if the 44 got threatened, I could buy the 44 back and sell to open the 43, have a lower potential profit, but I gave myself a little bit of cushion. And if it continues down, then I'll have to manage that one point spread. But I always like to start off with two spreads apart, two point spread, or if there's 50 cents, a dollar, or maybe even two as well. So I have that option to roll down one, roll the short down. But that's not available in our case. Number four, similar to what Sam said, a different order here than what I normally do, but that's okay. If you're concerned about it, you don't think it's going to move back up, you think it's going to continue to fall, you could perhaps sell a 47 call and buy a 48 or sell a 48 and buy a 49 that creates a bear call but combined you have an iron condor so you add a bear call if you think the stock's going to stay within that range 44 to 48 or 44 to 49 whatever your preference you create a condor 
Now, what does that do? That gives you a little bit more credit, so you have a little bit more profit and a little bit more buffer. But you didn't take care of this. It could still fall, and you could still lose on the position. Okay, or if it recovers and moves back up, you could lose on the bear call spread and take a larger loss than you expected. Yes, you're going to have a higher net credit, but if it goes up to 48 and 49 based on what you originally expected, you take that $1 loss minus your 24 cents net credit, you've got a 76 cent loss in the position, even though it recovered back to where you were. But that is an option if you think it's stagnating now and it's not going to fall further. What it doesn't do is take care of the downside if it continues to fall. And it also gives you two ways to lose. Uh, number five, of course, if you really think the stock's going to change direction and it has become bearish, you could simply buy to close the short. I think it was about 40, uh, 52 cents, 53 cents here. So if you buy to close the short, you pay 52 cents, you keep the 12. Now what are you left with? You're left with a long put, just a 43 strike put option that would continue to profit if the stock moves down below 43. You're not in a spread anymore, you're just in a long put. With a cost basis that is equal to the buyback cost of 52 cents minus the net credit. So this would be 40 cents at the 43. What's the issue here? Well, if it recovers and moves back up, you lose that 40 cents. You need it to continue to move down on the position. So five is close the short, leave the long open. Okay, leave long open. Sorry, hard to draw sometimes. That's okay. Let's so close the short, leave the long open. Number six, um, we talked about creating a condor. Number six, of course, if I've become bearish, as Sam mentioned too, I could just buy to close the bull put, take that loss we saw, um, of about uh, you know 20, 30 cents, or 30 cents, I believe he said. I saw it to 27 cents. If he lost 27, and then open a bear call, do the opposite. So that's close and do the opposite. If your sentiment on the stock has changed, you're no longer bullish, your short put's being threatened, close the bull put for the loss, repair it with the opposite, a bear call spread. Now, what you'd have to decide here is if you want to keep tracking this stock that you haven't been able to really find the trend on, or is it better to just close and make it back doing bull puts on other stocks you're more bullish on or bear calls on stocks you feel are in more of a bearish trend rather than try to keep managing this one because what's the problem with closing and doing a bear call if you're right later on and you've still got four weeks to go and the stock does recover and move back up you could now lose on the bear call plus the loss you took on the bull put and it's not doing it in that fashion number seven is a number another one i wouldn't do so i can't do Buy to close the short and roll down one because we just have a dollar point spread. Number seven is the pendulum adjustment where I would just move the long option from the 43 to the 45. I'd sell to close the 43 and buy to open a 45, converting my bull put credit spread to a bear put debit with one move, one commission. And if the stock continued to move down, then I'd have a profit. The pendulum adjustment works best if the stock is already between your strike prices, if it was already at 43.50, 43.75, it would work better in that fashion. This is not the time to use the pendulum adjustment. We can't go down one. So you could close it now, take the loss. You could roll the whole spread down. We could create a condor. You could close the short and leave the long open, but you've gotta be really bearish for that to work. Or you could close the bull put and do the opposite, a bear call credit spread at the higher strikes or a bear put debit spread. Okay. Yeah, and, and this is something I can't really get into. I don't do individual analysis on a stock. Sam makes the comment, Yelp will come back. Um, we'll come back by when is a question. It gapped on earnings. Maybe it was profit taken even today at a huge gap. So he doesn't feel that Yelp is in a bearish mode. And going back to what we saw on the chart, I'm not, well, that's not going to help us, is it? There you go. I'm not saying this is completely bearish, but usually when you see these jumps, there's a little bit of decline back and then it moves back up, right? But if you're worried about your spread, those were the seven things we could do. Close it 
and just try to make it back. Roll the spread down if you want a little bit more comfortability. Uh, open a bear call spread, but then if it comes back up, you could lose on that as well. Um, at the same time, uh, you could close it and open the opposite bear call. Instead of doing the condor, just close this spread and open the bear call as well. Um, and of course, other things you might want to consider is you could hedge this by buying the stock or, as Sam mentioned, doing a, a just selling a call. I'd prefer to do it as a spread rather than just selling a call on the position. And you'd have to be really bearish to do that. Option number five was it to buy to close the short put and leave the long open. What would that look like? Someone asked. Okay, so if I just bought to close the long, see, we've got the prices here, 121 to 127. Let's call that 125. So my buyback would be 125 which means I'd actually have a cost basis, I'm sorry, on my long 43 put of about $1.10. Okay, so let's just simulate that. We're going to buy to close the 44, and that just leaves us with a long put at 43 with a cost basis of 112. So now my break even, of course, is going to be around 41.18 or so. Okay, so I'd need the stock to be trading at 41.18, 18, uh, 4188, I apologize, 4188 to get to break even and to start profiting. So you'd be really bearish on that. And although I can't give you direct advice on stocks, I don't think that's the scenario. So, Kokan, that's what I'm looking at with this position. Honestly, you still have time. You're still out of the money. I think a trigger point, as Sam mentioned, might be if the stock hits or starts dropping below the 20-day moving average. It's still above that. That's one of the triggers I might use. Um, and in that scenario also, we've got to wait till Monday anyway to see what happens. Um, but my trigger would probably be around, uh, you know, the 1% rule. So I'd look if the stock was trading at around 44.50 or 44.40, that's when I would consider doing the rolls. You're still at 45.32. You still got some good cushion there on the position. It hasn't dropped below the 20-day moving average. The MACD hasn't gone negative yet, although it's closing together. So... I'm still okay with this position because you still have a long way to go. But we did review this five or six management techniques. Of the seven available, maybe five could be used. I don't think just buying and close the short and leaving the long is the right thing to do at this time because it's not really looking like it's in a bearish mode. That could all change on Monday. Okay, so that's what we're kind of looking at there. All right. Uh, Mike S. had commented, hi, hope all is well. Uh, hi, Mike, how are you doing? Yes, I hope everything is all well with you also. And Mike's follow-up question is, is open interest an element that should be considered or relied on heavily when trying to trade an option? Uh, my answer to you is yes, but it shouldn't be a primary factor. All right, let's talk about that. Very simple, Mike. I'm interested in opening a long call. I want to buy calls because I think the market's going to be bullish, or I'm going to buy puts because I think the market's going to be bearish. For sake of argument, not giving any projections, let's say I want to buy calls. I want to look for when I'm buying a call because I think the market's going to be bullish over the next 60 days. Well, naturally, I want the option to be 60 to 70 days out in time, so I take advantage of if that movement is any time during that time frame. I don't want to necessarily buy a weekly option because if I miss it, then I have to pay more money to buy the next week and more money to buy the next week. I would have been better off buying one or two months out to begin with up front. What else do I want? I want a growth stock. I want a stock in a positive trend, whether they use MACD, Bollinger Bands, RSI, even just simple moving average. I want an uptrending stock. And I want a stock that's maybe shown good earnings or good strength and stock itself that probably has some decent volume and a decent market cap. Now, I already have criteria set up for you as a default, or any as default searches in the long call for Bollinger Bands and more. But if I'm creating a search right away, I'm going to go right into the search. And before I do anything, before I start looking at numbers or data, I'm going to scroll down to the bottom. There's the Bollinger Band default. And of course, you see we've created some others during the webinars here that we've saved. But I'm going to clear the filters. I'm going to empty everything out for the options, the technicals, the fundamentals, and the lists. Let's set up what we wanted to see. I want to look for calls that are at least 60 days out in time. So I'm going to leave this at all expirations. I could just go to October. I'm going to leave it all expirations. 
I'm going to set it to be 65 to at least, let's say, 120. Those are my time frames. Could be different months. I'm not going to worry about anything here. And for sake of argument, since I am bullish, I just want to look one strike out of the money. So I'm going to go one to one, a little bit cheaper cost, not as good probability um, of retaining most of the value if I went one or two strikes in the money, but I'm bullish, so I'm going out of the money speculating. Strike price I'm not too worried about, option ask price. Well, I may see stocks in here, Mike, that are in the $50 to $60 range when I put in my other criteria. I may see stocks in the $400 range. I may see stocks in the $1,000 range, but I know that I don't want to pay more than, let's say, $9 per contract, $900 to buy one. And if it's only $3, I might buy three contracts, so it's still $900, okay? Delta, I'm not going to worry about in this case because I set the strikes to be one-to-one -one out of the money, right? So that's going to be a delta of around 0.5 to 0.4, somewhere in that range. I've already set that without setting delta. And probability, I know my probability is going to less than 50%, so I'm going one strike out of the money. Now, I'm going to come back to this here, but one thing I want to do is I want to make sure that the monetary bid-ask spread is less than, let's say, a dollar. And I want the percent bid-ask spread also to be less than 50%. Okay, so that's just why is, am I doing that? Well, this kind of comes into two things, Mike, that we were talking about. If you have a wide bid-ask spread, that can mean a few things. It can mean there's not a lot of activity on that option, recent activity, open interest, or volume, because it's too far out of the money or too far in the money. That's when you start to see wide bid-ask spread when they're not actively traded. You may see wide bid-ask spread because there's a lot of interest in it, but it has a high volatility. Some event just crossed, whether that be earnings, or earnings is coming up or an FDA phase two or phase three drug trial if it's a biotech company or something along those lines. So I'm gonna go ahead and limit it so that I can make sure that I have a better chance of getting in at a good midpoint and getting out at a good midpoint. And we're gonna talk about that in a moment as well. Now let's just leave this. I'm not even gonna worry about volatility, percent implied volatility range. Although I probably would want a call or a put that's Below maybe 50, I'm going to go 60, 60 percentile of its IV range. What's that? Um, that's where the options implied volatility is now compared to where it has been over the life of the option. If I'm buying an option now, I don't want it to be in the 90th percentile of its IV range because if it reverts back to the norm, my call or my put option could lose a lot of value without the stock even moving. Volatility crush, it's reverting back from its let's say the total volatility was between 0.2 to 0.9, it's pretty high, but let's say right now it's at 0.85. If during the course of this trade, it reverts back to 0.5, I'm gonna lose a lot of extrinsic value in that case without the stock even moving. So I'm gonna limit that down to start with to have a lower implied volatility range when I'm buying, and I might want a higher IV when I'm selling. Okay. And I'm going to get to a question that just came in in a moment related to open interest. But now I've got just that basic options in. What do I want now? Fundamentals. Not going to worry about stock price, earnings per share growth. When I buy a call, I want to see a stock that has good management, a reflection of good management, where they recently had earnings, have earnings coming up, or had earnings 89 days ago. I still want to see a company that maybe has a good 10, 15% earnings per share growth. I'm gonna look for a good market cap too. Uh, this is measured in thousands. You see here the mid is 2,000 to 15 and large is 15 or higher. I don't want anything small cap that can fluctuate too much. It drives me nuts when I buy a call or a put on a small cap stock that's you know under $20. Let's say the stock's at 12 and I buy a 13 strike call. The stock falls 50 cents. My call might drop 40 cents, but that might represent 70% of what I paid for it to begin with. It's, it's kind of infuriating to see that much. So I'm going to go mid cap. And on that note, too, I'm just going to look for stocks greater than 20. Avoid smaller price stocks. Not to say lower price stocks can't be very profitable with calls and puts. I'm just avoiding it for this example. I'm not going to worry about earnings. Not going to worry about ex-dividend date. But we are going to go into technicals now. Why? Well, I want good volume. This one's measured in thousands, so I'm going to say at least 750, which means I want to see stocks on power options that trade at least 750,000 shares per day on average over the last 90 days. The Bollinger Band, 
We saw that earlier on Yelp. Let's navigate back over to the chart real quick on Yelp. Here's the Bollinger Bands, this upper and lower band highlighted in red. Okay, so here's the upper band and here's the lower band. And in general, so you can see I want stocks that are sort of near the upper band. I want it near this range. And this is what was reflected in our filter called percent BB20. The stocks at a percent BB20 of 100, the stock's right at the upper band. If it's at zero, it's right at the lower band. So I want a trending stock. I want stocks that are greater than 80%, within 80% up to that upper band. Very simple, I want stocks that are going to be trading above the 20-day or 50-day moving average. I'll use the 20. I'm going to look for stocks with a MACD signal. That's this here, the blue line and the red line down below. That's just what I use. You can use whatever you want. But here, the MACD, the blue line and the red line are bullish signals when you have a MACD crossover and it starts to move up. This was affected by earnings. But I want something where the MACD line has been above the EMA 9 the signal line for at least two to three days or more. Okay, so it's just trending. I'm just looking for things that are trending. And I tell you what, so I'm going to put over three days, MACD over the signal. And I want my MACD to be positive, meaning I want that blue line to be above the divergence line in this case. Now, let's go back. And I'm going to answer this, this comment that came in as well as give you uh, some other insight I was working at as well. Okay. Now, a comment came in. It's uh, it's from my work. Um, that's just the name that's there. It says the open interest cannot tell you which position are synthetic or not, so it's difficult to understand the direction. You're right. Open interest is a measure of total open contracts on the market for that strike. You don't know if it's buy or sell. So we're not talking about direction with open interest. We're talking about is it something that Mike should use to weigh heavily on his process of selecting a stock or a call or an option. Now, Mike, my answer to you is it shouldn't be the main thing, but here's the catch. Now, I'm talking about long calls now, just buying a call. I don't know your portfolio size. I don't need to. I know my portfolio size, but you don't really need to know that. What we do want to know is on average in a given strategy, whether it's bull puts we were looking at for CoCon earlier, whether it's straddles that Sam was talking about for earnings on his comment, whether you're buying calls or whether you're doing covered calls, what is the average across your portfolio? The average number of contracts in a trade, okay? Now, that may depend on cost if you're doing covered calls, right? So if you dedicate, let's say, $6,000 to a covered call position, a new covered call position in your account, naturally on a $60 stock, you're doing 100 shares in one call. If it's a $20 stock, you're doing 303. If you've got a $50,000 portfolio and you're allocating 10, let's say 20, you're allocating 20% of that to buying calls, which I think is too high, but you know, 10 to 15. But anyway, you're allocating 20% or $10,000 okay, to buying call options. You might want to diversify into 10 positions, which means you're allocating $1,000 to each call, right? And take $10,000 into calls. You want to have 10 calls to be diversified or 10 calls and 10 puts based on bullish and bearish. You're averaging 1,000. Well, one option contract might be $9, so you're only buying one. Another one might be 50 cents, so you're buying a lot more, 20. Okay, but where am I going with this? In general, you know what your average number of contracts is per trade. Mine and Ernie's rule of thumb for investors when they ask is that if you don't have a gauge of what you should use for volume or open interest, use a volume that's at least five times the average number of contracts you trade on a position and an open interest at least 10 times the number of contracts you trade on a position. So if your average is five for buying calls, let's say, in a smaller account or you're using a smaller portion of your portfolio, nothing wrong with that. Use an option volume greater than 25 an open interest greater than 50. And you can increase that more as well. Higher open interest will typically mean lower bid ask spread, more opportunity to get in and out of the position if you've hit your goals or you're worried about management as we saw earlier with CoCon. Okay. Um, I do trade a lot of married puts and radioactive trades as many of you know. 
that structure involves me buying a put that's at least 150 days out in time. There is not a lot of activity, even on quality stocks, with puts that are that far out in time. But I still make sure that the volume is at least two or three times the number of contracts I would be trading in the position, and the open interest is usually about 10 times that number as well. But you can go higher, and there's nothing wrong with looking for a higher volume or open interest. It should be a consideration, Mike, but it shouldn't be the major consideration. The other factors of what you'd look for as far as the strike price to match your trading plan, using a good volatility range, the expiration time frame, stock trends, good volume, good management, and other qualities should be more of a consideration in your long call trading plan as opposed to volume and open interest, but it definitely should be considered. Okay, let's get it. Let's see what we've got here. Probably too many. Wow. I'm on fire today. <laughs> Only five positions match my results. They're all for November expiration. Uh, automatic data processing, AbV, Apple, Dollar General, CSX. Don't know if these are going to be profitable or not. I'm not saying that. But that's how I use the volume and the open interest. You'll get the same conversation if you talk to Ernie. He'll just make it shorter and answer it directly and say, oh, well, if you know on average you trade 10 contracts, your option volume today should be five times the number you trade on average. Your open interest should be 10 times. It should definitely be a consideration. It should definitely be a filter that you use to make sure you're seeing more liquid options, but it shouldn't be the determining factor. Uh, was that RJ? Oh, I'm sorry. It's... um. I'll say, oh, so I'm sorry, folks. I had one there and it disappeared, okay? Okay, so I'm sorry, my work is Fernando. Got that settled down. Okay, got that. Good, Fernando, good. Um, let's see, I'm saying, I was just looking at your comments. The one thing I saw, something came in from RJ and it wasn't um, Rajiv, it was a different uh, attendee. Uh, RJ had commented in and said, is it okay to open a position you're bullish on if there's low open interest and low volume? What he means, of course, is that if I am bullish, Apple's a terrible example. They always have volume and open interest. But anyway, if I'm bullish on Apple and I really have a strong feeling that Apple's going to hit 240 by end of October, I'm sorry, end of September, beginning of October, and I find the option strike I want using the long option tool. I'll walk through that in a second. But it only has two contracts traded and an open interest of three. And I'm plating on trading 10 contracts. Is that okay? It's probably okay because it's Apple and more volume will settle into it later on. If it's a stock you've never heard of, something you heard on the news, you want to take a flyer on it, but it doesn't look like there's any volume or open interest across the strikes, that would be a concern is my opinion, okay? Uh, what I meant was the long option finder, great tool that we have. You can find it under the long call and long put, but you just put in your stock symbol, your expected price, I'd mentioned $1,000 um, in this case, but I'm saying I think Apple might hit 240. It's not a real thought, not a recommendation or suggestion, just showing how the tool works, but I think it might hit that date on, let's go September 30th, okay? Now, there we go. In that brief instant, what this tool did is it went out and grabbed all the available premiums that are naturally I could afford with $1,000. All options for all expirations on Apple grabbed the current price and showed, calculated what they would theoretically be worth if the stock hit my target on my target date. We see here the October 235 at 138 per contract. I could afford seven contracts. Would have a theoretical value of 707. If Apple went to 240 on or around September 30th, so that'd be a 410% return. 138, 707. So we have 410% return on the position. It's ranked them by highest return to lowest. And someone might say, well, why aren't the standard Septembers? Why aren't the August weeklies there? Because I chose September 30th this date. All the weeklies would have been expired at that point or missed the window. So it's based on what I select. So it's got to go to October and November. Like I said, if I thought it was bullish in a two-month period, I have to look for options that are at least 65 or 70 days out in time so I don't miss the window. Okay. 
But this tool does that for you. If you ever had a question, which option would give me the best bang for the buck if I think this will do X or this will do Y, the long option finder here underneath long call or long put, put in your stock, your expected price, your target date, and in just a second, you'll see which option would give you the best return of the stock hit your target price on your target date. Okay, so we've talked about, uh, I'm sorry, we've talked about the long calls there, and uh, we talked about uh, the, the chart a little bit using the Bollinger Bands, RSI, what settings to use. Percent implied volatility range is something you might want to consider, Mike, if we were just talking about buying calls. The number of contracts, again, I mentioned you trade in a covered call or a naked put because you got to buy the stock or put up the full cash amount, so you might only be doing three or four contracts. I'd still want a volume five times the number of contracts I'm planning on trading and an open interest of 10 times as a minimum the number of contracts. Okay. Uh, sorry, Sam, was, I was going through his comments there. He said Walmart was good, uh, HD was not. Um, Macy's was really good, had that good earnings, but then the investors got out of it as well. Um, also, and you're in that Apple trade, you've got the uh, 31 August, you're into that position. Okay. Yeah, earnings is the uh, Sam's comment when I was going through earlier. Sam's comment was that the earnings uh, are the engine that drives the stock, and that's that's what I feel as well. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, yeah, and going back there, uh, one more step. Fernando had commented earlier um, when he was talking about the open interest is not an indicator if it's going to be bullish or bearish. It's not. It's an indicator of interest in the position, uh, an indication of the contracts being traded. You don't know if it's bull or bear. And uh, he's, uh, Fernando went on to say the example was the married put we were long on. I guess it had a high open interest, but it didn't necessarily end up being bullish for him yet at the time. Uh, last comment here, uh, just little comments here I'm going through. Um, Sam had mentioned, oh, Sam, I got something good for you too. I want to comment on that. Um, related back to the Yelp question, Sam had commented in that says he's going, uh, looking at Canopy, Inc., CGC, or WEED uh, as bullish moves right now. And for a portfolio hedge, Sam bought 30 calls on UVXY, one of the volatility sort of ETFs, at $5.00. He sold them Wednesday at 10.50. Okay, you got the 100% gain. All right, so you got 100% gain. You bought calls UVXY was at 9.20. Very good. I had mentioned a few weeks ago uh, when we were still doing it. I don't know if I put it into this portfolio. No, um, no, I didn't. I didn't put it on the webinar portfolio. I had back on uh, August. Almost around the same time we talked about it. No, it was August uh, 2nd or uh, yeah, it was early August, August 2nd, August 4th. I had purchased as the hedge a small amount. I had done four VIX calls for September, 16 strike, I believe. And it was not a dollar twenty at that point. It was about oh, it was about uh, ninety seven cents a piece. The total invested was like five something. Oh no, it was over a dollar. That's right. It was four ninety. Yeah. So maybe I'm off here by a little bit. Anyway, uh, the VIX calls three ninety eight. A little bit higher. It must have been. I apologize. Let me edit this. So if I need to edit a position in the portfolio, just go to position actions and edit position. I should just grab what I had in my other portfolio. It was like one twenty five. Let's just go one twenty five. Yeah, that's about right. Five dollars. Long story short, um, yeah, VIX is at twelve sixty four now. I don't know if it's a buy yet. VIX at twelve, then buy. Sam says, yeah, I got into these when it was at eleven. I bought the sixteens. I could have bought the fourteens. I bought the sixteens. With yesterday's movement, I'd been sitting on these for a while. But with yesterday's movement, this was at a hundred percent gain at one point. The four contracts they had gone up to a value of. Uh, I believe 290. I missed that, but I did get to sell them for a 98% return, but I only sold half. And then as of today, they're still at a 37% gain with the remaining two from the purchase price. But I was talking to a customer in a coaching session on Monday. And oh, let me do this real quick. I want to make ah store chart settings. I apologize. There we go. I was talking to a customer on a coaching session Monday morning, and um. 
in addition to some of the other topics we covered, he wanted to cover the discussion about using VIX calls as a hedge. He was in the September 14s and the October 14s or 15s. He staggered two months of VIX calls for insurance and four or five contracts in September, four or five for October. A good move. I tend to just use one at a time. But what I did mention to him during our conversation, and this is talked about in, in some of our blog posts where we talk about stock or portfolio insurance or we talk about the VIX, is that when you're using VIX or even UVXY as Sam does, or any of these volatility hedges against your portfolio. So what happens when fear gets in? The volatility spikes naturally, VIX calls move up, then they become really expensive. Sam, I believe, does what I do, and the idea is not to get greedy. So when you have that jump in the VIX, and your calls are at that 100%, 90, 95% return from your purchase price, it is a good idea to close them or sell half. Don't get greedy thinking the VIX is going to continue up because normally what happens is the event happens and it spikes. If you think it's going up to 22, the event would have caused it to go up to 22 right away. Yeah, and Sam says you get out of the spikes. And, and I had mentioned that to the, the customer I was talking to on Monday, Sam. And he says, well, how do you know what the spikes are? This is a spike. When it happens and you see it start to pull back, get out or get out of half especially if you can pay for the entire position, which I did, okay? And so I left the other two calls open, but I got out here. If I had waited thinking, oh, tomorrow if this continues, it'll go up to 18 and 19, I might have a three or 400% return. No, right now, I'm only about a 27% return. I missed the window. So you have to do it right away. Let's go back to a year, maybe even six months. I think I'll go a year. Let's change our chart to a year of VIX. Let's just go year to date. See, there was one scenario here that might have worked. Remember February 5th through 9th, the volatility jump. Now, it started to creep up. And actually, I got lucky because I wasn't at 100% gain. Look at it. We were at 9, right? The VIX was at 9 on uh, January 31st, January 30th, January 29th. We were, you know, here, beginning of January, 9.50. Almost hit 9 even. Almost went below 9 and hit 8 in any case. But then all of a sudden started to see a little bit movement. My calls didn't have 100% here, thankfully, because I would have closed half of them. But then here's the spike, okay? Now, that was phenomenal. Yes, I got out at 38 or 39, which was still fantastic for hedge. I think I made $8,000 on a $400 hedge. I sold them for about 8,000. In any case, that was fantastic. But if you didn't catch it there, the next two days, you're still at a gain from where you were here, but not that much. It does go back up. Then in five days, you're back down to normal. Um, so you got to catch it as quick as you can. It's not something you say, oh, it moved up. So I, this time it worked, but only a day. If you waited an extra day, you lost 300, 400% return on those. And you're not really doing this for return. You're doing it to hedge the portfolio. It's an extra hedge. Okay, so uh, where am I going here? March 20th. It wasn't even that bad. But the other one we had was from March 20th to April 5th. And you see here, we crossed over 20 again. We were almost back down to 15 or so. And then it just went right back up to 22, 23. You wanted to get out right around here. Maybe here if you waited, and that's fine. But then we pulled back here. Look at the next one. Jumps almost up to 20, May 28th, May 29th. Almost jumps to 20, but three days later, you're back down to 10. Here's another spike, almost to 20. This stayed pretty good here at June to July. But then real quick, we're back down here. So you've got to catch them quick. And this one yesterday, you can see it. Let me clear that out. It's even harder to see when we're in a year. But there it is, the one blip. And we're right back to 10. Okay? We're close to it. We're not at 10. We're at 12. When it drops below 12, gets to 11.50, gets to 11, and buy again. And Sam says, I can always... Oh, you're talking about something different. I apologize. Um, Sam says he's out of UVXY and uh, even Apple right now. Um, he says, I can always buy... A Again, if it goes up, UVXY is similar, but it is a different animal. Uh, we talked about this back in February. We even talked about this back in March. When I sold out of my VIX calls here, my apologies, when I sold the VIX calls in this time that I had bought, you know, back here for this expiration or for two months out actually, and when I sold them out here, I couldn't buy again. 
these things were too expensive. I'd be buying, I'd, in order to get a $1 premium, I'd have to go up to the 60 to 70 strike. It's not going to go to 60 or 70, hopefully. <laughs> it's not going to hit that high. Um, so you waited. Now, what are the two things you do? Can you buy a put? No, because they're too expensive. A thing to do at this point after the spike is to usually just take that return, the hedge against your portfolio and move on. Or you could consider doing a bear call credit spread on the VIX. I didn't do a bear call on the VIX up here after the jump. I just took, sold half of those contracts I had in VIX calls, left the rest open going into September. I may roll them to October um, as well. And here I did not do a bear spread, uh, but I did over here. I did one bear spread over here until it settled back down and then I bought more calls here. Yeah, I was there. Is it the 14, 13? No, it was 1250 to 13 mark is when I bought them back. But that's another idea you can do. After the spikes, I don't buy back in the VIX calls because they're too expensive. And I don't buy the VIX puts because they're too expensive. Um, I can do the bear call credit spread with the inflation. If it comes back down, it looks pretty good and you get inflated premiums. So it's, but you only do bear calls on the VIX after a jump. Or, you know, Sam might do bear call credit spreads on UVXY after a big jump. I'm kind of curious. Let's see where we were. Uh, we'll, we'll take a look at that in just a moment. Um, something else I wanted to do also. Um, I'm going to go back. This is related back to Mike S's uh, question. And there was a follow-up comment to something I said. And, okay, there we go. Is this right still? Yeah. Okay, so sorry. Going back to that long call search I had, I'd made a comment, I don't know are these going to be profitable or not. And someone had mentioned, well, why did you put those criteria in if you don't know they're going to be profitable? It was a pure example. Okay, well, I was doing that as a pure example. Well, let's take a look. Um, neutral to bullish somewhat. But anyway, regardless of what the market did, I'm going to go ahead and save this search. We're going to call it quick long call test aug 17. Okay. All right. So what was roughly three months ago? Well, that would have been May, right? Beginning of May, middle of May would have been three months ago. So what I want to do now is I'm going to go to back test. Now that I've saved my search, I'm going to go to smart history. I make no promises. I'm just curious. Uh, I can only go, this is a trial account. I apologize. I can only go back as far as June 18th. So I'm going to go back to June 18th, two months ago. And, uh, Quick long call test, August 17th. Now, this might take a while because it's a little after 5 o'clock. In the background, we're updating today's closed data for all the options. This is interesting. With that basic search we created, looking for stocks that are trending up based on Bollinger Bands, MACD, some open interest, some volume, mid-cap stocks, some good average stock volume, and other basic criteria, one strike out of the money. We have 16, 15 results if we would have run that same exact search on June 18th. Were they profitable? Let's take a look. Calculate group results. The system's now gonna look back at those and grab what the prices were. Calculate what the gain or loss would have been if we hit expiration on any of those or after they're still open. Square, JD, Post Holdings, Etsy, and so forth. So we've got some 300, 250, 188, 200% gains, 200% gains, but a 92% loss, full loss of 100% because management wasn't applied, which would have been applied. But this search, if run on June 18th, would have been 47% winners, but we still would have had a 25.6% return. Not fantastic, not great, but as again, I was just starting that on the fly. I wouldn't have opened all 16. I would have done research and analysis and only opened a few. No guarantee they all would have been winners. Why did I just do that? Well, I wanted to show you that if you have questions, if you think one of the default searches on power options, is it a really good screen or is the search you created a good screen, you can use the back test in any of the strategies, save your search or just pull up the default searches that we have to run a test against. Go back to your desired time frame. If you have the history on the trial, you'll be able to go back three to four months. And you can see what would have happened if you had run this search two months ago. What would my gain or loss been in the search if I ran it one month ago? For even if you're doing a weekly, you could go week by week. That's what the back testing offers you. Now, what I could do is now that I have the results and I saw which ones were winners and which ones were losers, I could go through and analyze each one of those individually and see if there's anything that looked to be in common of the losers that wasn't included in the winners. 
whether it was something as simple as put call volume ratio or uh, a different implied volatility range on the calls so that I could filter out those and see how those worked over different months to try to get a better set of criteria. By the way, the default criteria we have in all the strategies, that's how we come up with them as we run exhaustive tests, not using this tool. We have a, a different tool that we can use, but we run iterations and iterations of tests, changing every little knob and filter until we get one that works. And then we go and revisit those search criteria, usually every one to two months, maybe it's around three months for certain things, depending on if it's a weekly search or if it's a monthly search, just to see if it's still performing well or does it need to be tweaked. And very rarely do we tweak those default criteria. Okay. Um, this is this is a question I don't really like to answer too much, Rajiv, because it gets into me sort of analyzing a position. Um, Rajiv says, good afternoon. UVXY and VIX is down after US-China meeting announcement. Yeah, the, the VIX has fallen down after recent things. But he said, is strangle or straddle good option in Tesla? I have no idea. Because that that's that's not based on anything related to VIX right now. That's probably not based on anything related to what's going on in the general market conditions or anything else. It's based on how much trouble is Elon Musk going to get in for saying what he said the other day? How much has he offended large investors into the corporation? He came out today and he says, yeah, he's just been saying things because he's been stressed because he's overworked. People don't like to hear a CEO say that too often. Um, so there could be fluctuations in Tesla. You're right. But because of the volatility, not in the market, but the volatility on Tesla itself, a straddle or strangle is going to be expensive. I wouldn't do a short straddle or short strangle because if he does decide to pull the plug, if he does decide to start the process to take the company private, as he mentioned, there's going to be a lot of fluctuation going up or down, depending, probably down, which could hurt or short, kill you on a short straddle or short strangle. It would help the long, but if you get into the long overpriced and nothing does happen and it settles down, you're going to get volatility crush and no movement in the stock. So if you think there's going to be a wild swing one direction or the other because of the events that are going on with Tesla, not related to market conditions, not related to where the VIX and uh, UVXY are, because Tesla is probably going to keep a lot of its volatility for things that have been happening beyond the market just internally then a straddle or strangle might work, but it's going to be hard to pick the strikes because you have to pick a target first of where you think Tesla might swing and then see what structure you would need to set the break-evens near that or where it would be profitable. And it might be hard, extremely hard with volatility. Okay. All right. So Sam also mentions uh, mentioned dust there. There was a big movement on JNUG and uh, the opposite the other day as well. Um, he said, uh, selling the 45 calls on that right now. A counter to that, to the straddle or strangle idea, Rajiv, is, is this is something that can be beneficial, but I tell you two stocks, I don't think I'd do it on right now, but I'm going to stab myself in the foot here when I take a look. Sam says, Warren Buffett says that buy stocks when there's blood in the street, um, you did the same with FB when the scandal news came out. That was, of course, related to the, the privacy issues, um, sharing the things and, and, and the sharing the information on Facebook. So Sam bought there uh, with 165, sold him at 210, uh, did not wait for 215, 217, where it dropped afterwards. So that was a good one. Um, I don't think I would. Uh, another one that's been big in the news with blood in the street is uh, Papa John's. You know, everything that uh, I will say his name wrong, but uh, John S., you know, John Strassner's stun. I, you can see here there's a MACD crossover it's starting to look a little bit bullish, but blood in the street was here. And if you bought here after the first issue, right, the first issue that happened where they were, I uh, believe this was um, him trying to get out. Uh, had it, had it, what was the order there? They, he was trying to get they were trying to get him out. Uh, of being the CEO, of course, naturally they were taking huge losses from the earnings that happened before, and they were trying to get him out. And then he said he wanted to come back in. And there's that what do they call it, the shadow movement or whatever, all that uh, also. So if you got into here because AKA there was blood in the street, you took a pretty big hit. You know, that's about a 20% drop from 50 to 40. Now it's coming back up, so you're only about a five point drop from where you got in. 
this is a tough pill to swallow here. It's still based on timing. And we can even say that here, there was a positive MACD crossover that might look like a buy, and it lasted for a little bit. But if you didn't get out that three or four dollar gain, then poof, disappeared again. I mean, there's there's just too many weird things that could happen here. And I I'd check to see when those earn not when those earn yeah when the earnings are coming up. I know they were recently they had some, but I check to see when the next one is because that could cause problems. But this is sort of a crossover that I like to look for. It did just cross over the 20 day. It has a MACD crossover. The RSI is going more positive. It looks good, but anything can happen with this position because if, if if Papa John comes out and says he wants back in or he tries something else or he gets more funding to try to buy back in after he was ousted by the CEO, I'm sorry, after he was ousted, but then he wanted to come back in for more, it's tricky to say, okay? Um, that That's a move. Now, just related to that, to help Rajiv here, and I, I, I don't know what to think about this, and I hate trying to analyze stocks, so I'm not here to analyze stocks for you but i mean this is this could go any which way a straddle might be a good idea but when if it settles down and it goes back into its channel the straddle will kill you here because the volatility is still relatively high it does look slightly bearish recently in the past few days doesn't it but there's no guarantee that it'll continue that so i i can't uh yeah yeah, so what Sam was saying, and when he would mention that to me, he's saying no trend in TSLA so far, no no confirmed trend in TSLA. He's staying far away. I'm not going to tell you to do anything as far as staying away or do a straddle or don't do a straddle other than what I've just said, that if you think it's going to move significantly because more news is going to come out that might work, I can't advise that because it's probably overpriced and you need a larger move than you think you do because of the extra extrinsic value you'd have to pay into those options that are overpriced to make a profit. It's going to be tough. And it could work out greatly for you. There's, I'm not saying that at all. But I don't think it's going to be one of your common positions, Rajiv, that you and I talk about, that you post during these sessions, where you're doing a calendar, where you buy a call or put that's two to three weeks out, and you sell one that's one week out. I think anything on Tesla would probably have to be two to three months out in time or more because you don't know if the move's going to happen suddenly, and it could, and that would be good. But if you do something too short in, you might miss the entire window, not get the move that you want, and now you're stuck with overpaying into a straddle or a strangle or even a diagonal spread that didn't work out in those first two to three weeks. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it is 5.33 p.m. Eastern Time. I don't see any other questions that have come in, and I think I've commented uh, on all of the comments that came in as well. Um, Oh, and Sam's comment to mine was that, you know, only only buy if Tesla is not going to go private and staying as a public company. Yeah, that's, that's just a comment on buying and or, or doing the uh, doing a long call or possibly a diagonal, I think is what he's referring to in that case. But uh, yeah, it's tough to tell what's going to happen, isn't it? We just don't know. And um, that's part of the gamble, of course, and that's why we trade options is to try to find the best positions that suit our needs, sorry, and uh, what we're going for as well. So, um, okay. Uh, yeah, so I uh, just wanted to remind everyone, if you haven't done so already, those of you that are watching here for the first time, remember you can take a 14-day free trial to Power Options, test out the search tool and over 23 of those different strategies with the different fundamentals, technicals, and more. Uh, of course, you can also... Use the portfolio tools to track and manage your positions, evaluate rollout opportunities. Just go to powerop.com, first name, last name, and email address. You'll also get access to the two or three months of back testing and historical tools that we mentioned. Um, so you can take a free trial, no credit card required. And after that, the subscription levels start at $40 per month for end of day data only. Most popular service, of course, is the uh, delayed service at $60 per month. But you can upgrade to that historical service, which gives you full historical data back to 2006, so we're 12 years of historical data. Uh, and the real time, of course, is 120, uh, and then a, more beyond that. Of course, if you want other education, you can check out the blog at any time, blog.powerop.com. You can always go to the webinars page. It's a public page. You don't need to be logged in, www.powerop.com slash webinars.asp. Or you can check us out on YouTube, of course. Just go to YouTube and look for Power Options. And if you think of any other questions that you didn't get to ask today, remember, send me an email at any time to support at powerop.com. You can also reach me at support at radioactivetrading.com. 
You can also reach us during market hours at 302-992-7971. And of course, if you are on a trial, you are a subscriber, you can schedule one of those coaching sessions at any time. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you again for joining me this afternoon. I hope you all have a fantastic weekend, and I hope to see you all again next week as well. Um, we'll be back here Friday. We'll also have some other presentations going on um, during the week. You'll see more about that as well. So take care, everyone. Have a fantastic weekend, and we'll see you soon. Good night.